All right, everybody. Good to see you all here. Let's get the lecture going for this afternoon. So today we're going to be thinking about wave properties. So in the last lecture, we saw how we can combine Hooke's law for the force that we get on a spring with Newton's second law of motion. And that gives us what we call an equation of motion of something. And we see we get those oscillations. We get that wave-like behavior out of it. So we just saw at the end of last lecture how we get those sine waves. We get stuff waving about. So the focus for today, we're going to be thinking about some properties of those kinds of waves. So there's a few different things we're going to be uh, thinking about. I thought I might start with a kind of quick recap of what we saw last time. So at the end of the last lecture, we just got to um, these three figures here where we have the displacement, the velocity, and the acceleration. And this equation in the middle here, this is what we found. So starting with Hooke's law, so force is equal to minus kx. And then we say that force is equal to mass times acceleration. So what we found last time, we got the acceleration is equal to this. So k over m times x with that minus sign out in front there. And the reason this is an important thing to think about is because if we start with a sine wave for our displacement versus time, if that's our displacement versus time, then our acceleration versus time is the, well, the stick's not long enough, but it's the acceleration uh, versus time that we get at the top there. And even though the stick won't reach, you can see that it's just negative of what the displacement versus time is. So it obeys that wave equation over there. And fundamentally in physics, this is where waves come from. So it's important to see that connection between some of that elastic physics when we were looking at exerting forces on things and compressing things and this wave phenomena that we're going to be thinking more about today. So this is your basic wave. We've got a sine wave going on here. But in physics, when we think about waves traveling through things, there's a couple of main different kinds of waves that we might get in real life. So I've just got a slide thinking about the types of waves that we might get. Now, if you remember, we were thinking a lot about uh, uh, slinkies here. So I've got a little demo. You right to how with that? <laughs> Thank you for giving hand. So we've got a little demo here of the um, kinds of waves that we might see in physics. Thank you for your help with this. So you right to just hold the other end of the slinky, just about, just about there, and we'll get some waves going on. All right, so that's great. So um, if we just uh, stretch out the slinky, this is about as far as it can go. We can send some waves along the slinky, have a look at some of the properties here. So your basic kind of wave, if we exert a little uh, amplitude on here and then let it go, you guys can see the wave traveling up and down and then it reflects when it gets to the other side. So that's our kind of basic kind of wave that we might see where we have something going up and down along the wave, okay? And that kind of wave, we call them transverse waves. So they're the up and downy kind of waves. So maybe I'll just, I'll just try another one there. So we make a little initial displacement there and let it go. And then it happily bounces off either end of our material here. Now the key thing with waves is even though that energy is traveling along the wave, the slinky is only moving locally up and down. It's not like the whole slinky is moving along, okay? And that's really one of the features of waves that we can transmit the energy by exerting a displacement and then that's propagated along. Now let me just see if I can uh, damp that down. So that's the main kind of wave that we might be thinking about in physics, but um, in everyday life there's another very important other kind of wave where we're thinking more about compression, okay? So if I take a region of this slinky and I crunch it all up, so I've got an over dense region of the slinky, it's something really fun happens when we let this go. So we can let it go. Can you guys see that the over dense region shoots off down the end of the slinky and then it starts bouncing backwards and forwards. So you might call that a, a pressure wave. I'll just uh, send another one of these along here. So we've got the over density here and then we let it go. 
and then the whole thing shoots backwards and forwards. So that's the other main kind of wave we might have, where we've got the, um, the density traveling along the same direction of the wave. And those are called longitudinal. And that is a bit easier to remember because, you know, they travel along the direction of the travel. So those are the two main kinds of waves. The one more thing that I'll just kind of mention for the time being about these waves is that the speed that the wave travels along the slinky, it only depends on the property of the material. There's nothing I can do when I'm generating the waves to make them travel any faster. So I can make a little small wave over here, make a little wave, and the little wave goes along. But even if I'm making a really big wave, it doesn't travel along any faster. Even if I want to get the wave to the other side really quickly, I can kind of try my best to you know, make a really big wave. It's not going to travel along the material any faster. So if we think about you know, a sound wave, you can shout really loudly. It's only going to travel at the speed of sound. And sound waves, they're, of course, these kind of compression waves where they're traveling along the medium there. So those are the two basic kind of waves, and we can demonstrate them with uh, slinkies. So we might have some more demos from the slinkies later, but for the time being, that, that's all right. Thank you very much for your help with the uh, other end there. OK, so um, I did say, you know, slinkies, they are very important when it comes to physics. Uh, you know, in a sense that we can think of everything as being made out of uh, slinkies. And they're very useful to think about when we're thinking about waves. So these are the two main basic kinds of waves that we can have. But we also need to know our way around the main features of a wave that we might see out and about in the wild. So let's think about a transverse wave here. Now I've got a question here. You're going to hear people talking about the amplitude of a wave. So for this first question of the day, let's think which piece of this wave is what we call the amplitude. Now with this one, you can't really figure it out if you don't already know, but I'm sure if you ask the people around you, there's going to be someone in your group who's going to know which part of this wave is the amplitude. All right, let's take a look at the responses. Let's see what everybody thinks for the amplitude of this wave. Okay, so looks like people are mainly thinking about A and C. So it looks like everybody's thinking on the right kind of lines. At the amplitude, it tells us kind of how big the wave is in that direction. So it tells us how much of the wave that we have. Now, it is a bit tricky because they both are kind of giving us information about that height there, A and C. But the convention is for how we define the amplitude of the wave is we define it as the kind of that top half there. So what I've labeled A there. So uh, the correct option is answer A there. Oh, I think, it, I think it's been covered by the connection info, but correct answer is option A. So very well done, everybody who gave that question to go, especially if you got that A is the uh, amplitude there. Might have been a bit tricky there. People were thinking, is this a kind of uh, kind of double bluff situation with A for amplitude? But uh, this time, that's what it was. So A is for our amplitude. So that's the amplitude of our wave. That tells us how big it is. But the other essential thing about a wave is how long that wave is. So we saw with the slinky, we had some bigger waves, some smaller waves. This is the other important thing about a wave. So we're on this diagram here, which part of this wave is what we call the wavelength? And we use that symbol, that Greek symbol, a lambda there for the wavelength. That's the symbol we use. But which part of this wave corresponds to the wavelength. So again, with this question, it's not really one that you can figure out if you've not already seen this, but you can certainly eliminate a couple of options from the previous question. And remember the wavelength, it's the length we need for one whole cycle of the wave. So that is going to help narrow it down if you look for which of these lengths is going to give us a whole cycle of the wave here. All right, good to see those responses coming in. Let's see what everybody thinks for which of these distances is the wavelength. Okay, so again, looks like everybody's thinking on the right idea that the wavelength is all about how far we are along the wave. Now, the thing with option B there, that's in the kind of right direction, but we've only got one piece of the puzzle. That's not actually giving us a whole cycle. So if we just had option B as our wave, our wave, it's going to look 
like that bit and then just keeping that going on and on, which isn't quite right. So for the wavelength, we want to be including the whole length of a whole cycle of the wave up and down. So that correct option is option D over there. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. So that's the wavelength. Just remember, it's the length of the whole cycle of the wave up and back down again. Now, those are two important features. Those are what we need to have to describe one cycle of a sine wave like this. The other really important thing to think about when it comes to waves is how fast a wave is going to travel through a material, so what we call the wave speed. So let's take a look at this diagram, see what we can figure out here. So I've got the same diagram here. Now, just on the horizontal axis, instead of calling this position or time, I've got what I just call phase. Has anybody heard of phase before? Okay, oh, just a couple of people. Okay, so the idea with phase is that when it comes to waves, this axis here, what we you know, use as the horizontal axis, it may well be distance. You know, if you think about water waves, waves on the surface of some water, that wavelength is going to be a physical distance. But if we think about maybe, you know, we've got some mass on a spring like this, and the mass is just oscillating up and down, we can still kind of think of uh, an effective sort of wavelength of this. It's just, this isn't kind of moving around in position, uh, but there's just a certain amount of time that it takes for one whole cycle. So what this phase does as an idea is it tells us how far along we are in the wave. And it doesn't matter whether that's position or time or any other way in which a wave's oscillating. It's just saying that if our phase is over here, a phase of zero, that's the beginning of our wave. If our phase is over here, we're halfway through. And if our phase is over here, that's one whole cycle of a wave. That's what we mean by phase. So it might be a bit confusing, but if you want to think of this as just how far we are along the wave, that's absolutely fine for now. So we've got our amplitude over there and we've got our wavelength. And these are the things that we need to start connecting together if we want to be thinking about our wave speed. So how fast is our wave moving along? So if we try and get this wave moving here, can you guys see the wave moving along? That's the kind of situation we might get maybe if we're looking at the side of a water tank or something, looking at those ripples moving along in the water tank. Now I'll try and get that going once more because it can be a bit kind of hypnotic if you see it all go in it for the first time. Let's try and get the wave going another time and watch very carefully. So all of the wave is moving at a constant speed across the screen. And we might say that the time for how long that wave takes to move one whole cycle, that's what we call the period of the wave. So I'll play this one more time. This time, try and pick just one location on the wave. So maybe just pick that location at the beginning of the wave over here. So try and just follow this point as the wave moves across the axis here. So there's the wave going and there's the point moving across and then it gets to the other side. So that's one cycle of the wave moving across and the time it takes for that wave to travel across, that's what we call the period of the wave there. So it's the time for one cycle of the wave to pass through. Now, if that's a wave moving along a surface or moving along a spring, that might be the time, you know, to, to pass across a surface. Or if we're thinking about, you know, describing something oscillating on a spring, it's the time for one cycle of that. So for the time for it to go uh, up and down and back to its original position. So this period is a very important property of the wave. But in physics, we more often I'm um, talking about the frequency of the wave. Who's seen frequency before? Okay, okay, a few of you. Okay, okay, fine. So if you have seen it before, then maybe this is a bit more familiar, but if you haven't seen it before, that's absolutely fine as well. So the frequency, it's just how many cycles per second we have of a wave. 
and we can relate period and frequency just like this. So our frequency is one over the period. So, you know, if our wave takes five seconds, then we can use that to work out what the frequency is. Or if maybe our frequency is something happens, you know, a hundred times a second, we can use that formula to work out what the period of one cycle is. So that's the basic idea with period and frequency. Let's have a couple of slides thinking about the units of these concepts. So, of course, there's an SI unit for frequency. So with this question, let's think which of these options is the SI unit for frequency. So again, with this one, you can't figure it out if you don't already know, but it looks like maybe about half the cohort have seen frequency before. So I'm sure you're sitting next to someone who knows which of these is going to be the SI unit of frequency. Okay, very good to see those responses coming in. Let's see what everybody thinks for the SI unit of frequency. All right, okay, fantastic. 100%, this is what I like to see. So, very well done, everybody. Looks like everybody got this one. SI units of frequency are hertz there, okay? So, fantastic work, everybody. I always like to see when we get a uh, kind of home run like that, 100%. Okay, so very well done with that one. Now, that's what we call the unit. But we can also relate this to our SI base units. And it's actually very important to think about what's going on with this fundamentally. So let's try with this question. We know that the unit for frequency, we call it a hertz, but how do we relate one hertz to our SI base units? So with this one, you can actually figure it out if you don't already know, because we know that frequency is one over time, and we know what the SI units for time are. So even if this is the first time you've seen this question or anything like this, you can work out from this equation what one hertz is in terms of our SI base units. You don't need to guess, you can figure it out from the equation. Okay, very good to see those responses coming in. Let's see what everybody thinks for what is one hertz in terms of our SI base units. Okay, so looks like no one's going for B and D. Some people going for C, most people going for A. Now, I can see why people might be thinking about option C there, so meters per second. But remember, we've got some meters in there, and meters per second, those are the units of speed or velocity. So I can see why people might be kind of drawn to that, because we have been thinking about wave speed and how fast things are moving. But remember, we don't need to guess with this equation because the units for time, well, let's write this out here. So the units for time is just the second. And frequency is one over time. So the units for frequency, it's just got to, oh, drop the chalk. Here we go. So the units for frequency, it's just got to be one over the units for time. So seconds to the minus one. So we can work it out from the equation. We don't need to just kind of try and guess or memorize anything. So that means one hertz, it's equal to one per second. So option A there. So very well done, everybody who gave that question to go. And especially if you got option A there, one per second. So, for example, if something we say might say, you know, it's got a frequency of 50 hertz, that means it happens 50 times a second. That's all it means by relating frequency and period like that. Now, I can see, like I said, why people might be drawn to that meters per second one. But remember, that's the units of speed. And actually, it's the wave speed that we're going to be thinking about next. So if you are already thinking a bit about speed, then that's all right, because we've got this question coming right up. So remember in that diagram, we had the wave and it traveled that distance of lambda. It traveled its own wavelength in 
the time of t, so in that one period there. So based on those two pieces of information, we know the distance, the distance is lambda, we know the time, the time is the period t. We can put these pieces of the puzzle together and figure out what our wave speed is. So which one of these equations is our wave speed in terms of the other properties of the wave? So again, with this one, you don't need to guess. We know that speed is distance over time. We know the distance and we know the time. And we know how time is related to frequency. So we have all the pieces of the puzzle there that we need to figure this question out. All right, let's take a look at the responses. Let's see what everybody thinks for our wave speed. OK, so nobody's going for D. Looks like most people going for option A. So remember, speed, it's just distance over time. And our distance is lambda, the wavelength. And our time is the period, so what we call t. So we have lambda over t. But remember, frequency is just 1 over time. So when we put those two pieces of the puzzle together, what we get there is option A. So V is equal to F lambda. So very well done, everybody, with that question, because there's a couple of pieces of the puzzle there that you need to put together. Now, this is a really important equation. I'm going to write it out nice and big in the red chalk, just because it's such an important equation. V equal to F lambda because it's a really important equation in physics. Now, in the workshops, we're going to have lots of practice with these kinds of questions because whenever we have an equation like this, we can always have questions like, you know, we can say, well, OK, if we know the frequency and we know the speed, we can work out the wavelength. Or if you know the frequency and the wavelength, you can work out the speed, that kind of thing. So, for example, if we're thinking about sound waves, if we know the speed of sound and we know the frequency of a particular sound, we can use that to work out the wavelength. Or other classic examples, if we're thinking about light waves, we know the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So if we know the wavelength of a particular uh, beam of light, then we can use that to work out the frequency. So it's a fairly simple equation, but do make sure you get the practice in working with this equation in the workshops and in the textbook, because we just want to make sure we're really confident using this equation. So those are some of the most important principles whenever we're thinking about a single wave traveling through a medium. But things get really interesting when we have multiple waves combining together we get really interesting phenomenon there and that's the phenomenon that we call wave interference has anybody done wave interference before okay so not quite not good a few people but not not quite so many okay so when it comes to thinking about wave interference there's two main kind of basic different types of wave interference that we might get so we can get what we call constructive interference and we can also get, I always think this sounds a bit kind of violent, sounds a bit dangerous. We can get what we call destructive wave interference. Now, that might sound a bit dramatic. So let's see exactly what these two different kinds of wave interference are, see what's going on here. So if we think about just having one wave over there, so it's a nice sinusoidal wave like we've been looking at, a nice kind of classic wave, really happy with that. And we can see on the diagram there, we know the amplitude of this wave. So its amplitude, it's got an amplitude of x. So this could be a water wave, and this could be, you know, the real height of the wave. Um, or, you know, it could be a sound wave, and this could be representing the density or something like this. We've just got some wave with an amplitude of x. Now, if this wave is traveling along, and it meets another wave with the same amplitude and the same phase. So another wave just like this one. What's going to happen when these two waves combine? Any ideas about this? What are we going to get? Oh, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Great way of putting it. So the amplitudes are going to get bigger. The amplitudes are going to combine. 
and wave interference, it might sound a bit tricky, but all we have to do is just <coughs> add the waves together at the same location. So if both waves have an amplitude of x, then when they combine, it's probably not a big surprise the combined wave is going to have an amplitude of 2x. So that's the idea with what we call constructive interference, because we have two waves and they kind of join together and they've given us a single wave with a bigger amplitude. Now, if we come over here, destructive interference sounds a bit more dramatic. It's exactly the same principle. So if we start with that regular wave that we began with amplitude of plus or minus x, gets a bit more interesting if this wave meets its kind of exact opposite. So if it comes along and it combines with a wave like this, so exactly is the same, but just flipped upside down. So instead of plus x, it's got minus x. What do we think is going to happen when these two waves combine with each other? Any thoughts? Exactly right. So when these waves combine, we're not going to get anything. They're going to cancel out. So we're just going to get nothing when they've combined. And that's what we call destructive interference. So it doesn't mean, you know, we've exploded anything or anything like that. It just means we've got two waves and they've cancelled out and they haven't given us anything. Now, this is actually a really important principle. One of the ways where this is really important is actually in uh, noise cancelling headphones. Does anybody have um, noise cancelling headphones? Okay, okay, a few people, a few people. Has anybody tried noise cancelling headphones, even if you don't have them? Okay, so you know what I'm, I'm talking about, right? So, um, you know, you kind of just put them on like some, some normal headphones, and then when you turn them on, they cancel out quite a lot of the, uh, the background noise there. Um, and they work on this principle of uh, destructive interference. So when you have some noise cancelling headphones, you've got the regular speakers and that's making the signal. But you also have somewhere um, a little microphone and the microphone is sampling the background noise. So the noise you want to cancel out. So maybe, you know, if you're on a plane, you don't want the noise of the engine, you don't want that rumbling. So the microphone on your headphones is sampling the background noise. And then there's some electronics in the headphone. And what that does is it takes that input signal, that noise signal, flips it upside down, and it adds it to what you're listening to. So the idea is that it uses that to cancel out your background noise. So noise cancelling headphones, they're not just reducing the background noise by just blocking the noise, like earmuffs or something like that, or ear defenders they're actually actively cancelling the background noise. Has anybody tried these on a um, plane, on a flight? Yeah, they, they work really well for, um, for plane noise because it's quite a sort of low frequency noise, quite um, amenable to being cancelled out. So that's the idea with uh, destructive interference, very important for something like uh, noise cancelling headphones. Now, this principle of wave interference, it's actually got so many applications. Um, and we've actually already seen a couple of weeks ago a really important example of wave interference in this device over here that we call an interferometer. Do you guys remember this from a couple of weeks ago when we think about pressure and stress and strain? So now that we understand a bit about wave interference, we can look in a bit more detail about what's going on here. So remember, we've got these two arms of the interferometer, and there's two four kilometer long laser beams going down there. And it's by interfering these laser beams that allows this interferometer to be so fantastically precise. So I've got a little animation here of what's going on inside. So we've got the two laser beams. And just kind of diagrammatically, the wavelengths of the laser beams are illustrated there. As the two mirrors are moving backwards and forwards, that's affecting the total path lengths of the arms. And what that means, if we come over here where we're receiving the light, we've got some sensor. If the waves are interfering constructively, then we get some light. But if the total path is just shifted by half a wavelength, then we get destructive interference. We don't get any light at all. 
And it's this principle of interference that allows an interferometer, so something like LIGO, to be so fantastically sensitive. And that's really what you need if you want to be sensitive enough to detect something like gravitational waves. So I think that's a neat animation, just kind of schematically shows us what's going on, the basic idea of interference there. So let's try this in an example for ourselves, uh, see what's going on with wave interference. So suppose I've got a couple of waves here. I've got one big wave over here with some long wavelength, nice big amplitude. And what's interesting here is it's interfering with a wave with a smaller amplitude and a smaller wavelength. So makes things a bit more interesting. So in this question, let's think about which of these four options are we going to get? So again, with this one, you don't need to guess. Remember, the basic idea is that the waves just add together in the positions where they are. So take a look at where the waves might be high, take a look at where they might be low. That's all you need to figure out which one of these is going to be the resultant of both of these waves interfering. All right then, let's see which one of these is uh, going to be our resultant. Okay, so looks like most people, most everybody thinking that it's either going to be C and D. And these both have the same basic kind of shape, right? So they're both kind of higher up towards the beginning here, and then lower up over there. But if we look very carefully at wave C there, it's actually squashed up a little bit closer over here. So when you add those extra waves on top, what you end up with is option C there. So very well done, everybody, with that question over there. Option C is the correct response there. So that's the basic idea with wave interference. But I've got uh, one more demo to show you guys where uh, wave interference is really important. And it's when we're thinking about wave reflections. So thank you very much for your help. There. You can just hold the other end over there. So we saw a little bit about wave reflections um, when we uh, had the slinky out. Uh, at the beginning, and that's really what I'd like to focus on now. So if I take, make a little wave here, watch what happens when the wave reflects off the other end there. Can you guys see that it comes back upside down? Can you guys see that? So if I make a little wave going downwards, it's going to come back upwards. So that's the idea of wave reflection. That when it goes along, it's reflected back the other way. Now, if I send some waves down here, with just the right kind of wavelength. Can you guys see that? It looks like the whole slinky is just oscillating up and down. And this is a very important kind of feature in physics because it looks like the whole slinky is just oscillating up and down. But one way to think about this is that we've got a wave which is traveling at just the right wavelength down the slinky that it's getting reflected halfway and then getting reflected back the other way upside down. And that's what adds together to give us that big old up and down emotion that we saw. So that's all it for the demo. Thank you very much for uh, help with that. That's great. So that's one example where wave reflection and wave interference are really important. So I've just got a little um, animation over here. Um, of what's going on with wave reflection there. So it might look like the whole business is just going up and down. But if we have a look in this animation there, if our transmitted wave is that blue curve that we see at the beginning, so it looks like the whole slinky is going up and down. But if we follow that big old blue curve over here, have a think about what's going to happen when it gets reflected. So it is going to get reflected back the other way, but flips upside down. So it's actually going to be reflected back like that red curve over there in the middle. That's what the reflected part of the wave is going to look like. And then when those two waves interfere, when we add them together, they're going to give us that combined wave, that purple curve over there. So that's the idea with a bit of combining wave reflection and wave interference. And if we set them going, they kind of look something like this. So we're sending those blue waves this way down the slinky. And then they're getting reflected over here. We're getting those red waves. 
and then when they combine we get this lower graph here we get this purple wave and it just looks like the whole business is moving up and down and that's actually very important whenever we're thinking about waves on musical instruments something like waves on a violin or something like that that's actually what gives rise to uh, what we call harmonics so the nice sounds that you hear from a violin i think oh i think this one's pretty badly out of tune but that's the basic idea with uh the kind of waves that you might get on a violin so we're going to have some questions in the workshop about wave harmonics this is the basic idea but make sure you give those workshop questions a go now last thing i'd like to share with you guys for today is just another um simulation that you guys can try for yourself so if i bring this in over here so this is the same place as that simulation um last time so p-h-e-t uh physics simulations you can try your own virtual wave on a string and it's really it's quite fun especially if like me you know you're you're easily amused you've got a string here and you can send waves down it and you can see them uh reflected and coming back and you know you can send different waves so all the stuff we were doing with the slinky you can try that out for yourself just in the website and then also you can send continuous wave standard and you get really interesting behavior when they are being reflected and when they're combining so that's quite a fun thing to play around with i'd really encourage everybody i uh, give that a go because you know we've worked through some of the math today but it's quite fun and it does just help to understand uh trying it out for yourself so i think that's a good place to wrap things up today uh, we're going to be thinking about some more really interesting wave phenomena on uh, Thursday so if you have any questions we got the drop-in help session right now come down and ask any questions otherwise I'll see you guys all on Thursday so I'll see you then